met a gypsy. The, I mean, dude, being a trainer would be it's, the, the it, worst dude, job. It was, it like, was, I mean, it was, it was good. It's just, it's, it's not like being a mechanic. Cause if you're a mechanic, you're working for the team. Like you're there at the shop. Like you're hanging out with the boys. Like you're working on a specific bike. You know, you're like, you're just there. What I did as a trainer, like I was my own entity off here just working with the riders trying to work with the mechanics you know like trying to make sense out of this whole thing and being at the races and making sure them because i was a mechanic for 15 years so i could go in there and be like hey you know yeah, the suspension, yeah you kind of you know, know both sides and, and most of the people in the industry were like okay with that with me coming in and being like what about tire choice or air pressure or you know even if we're at a practice track like you know we need to look at, you know, changing this, like, you know, whatever, you know, and, and I was able to kind of be kind of on both sides and uh, work with the riders, you know, work with the mechanics, work with the teams. Bones would call me to ask if things were going good suspension wise, like when we're just riding and training. Um, so it just, it's, it became tougher when more trainers started coming in. Mm. Cause I ended up training for 17 years. So my early years was when I had like the RV and then the, when the economy hit, like that whole thing happened and it started coming back. That's when I did the rock star thing. And, and I thought it was going well until they let me go. And then, then Jake ended up coming back from, from Baker's back to California. And I worked with him his last season on Cowie and he just had a bunch of injuries and, and uh, then I transitioned over to just start doing like amateur kids. Yeah. Because then Ryder was getting older, and I wanted to be with him going like to his races. Around more, and, yeah. And uh, and with the amateur stuff. Yeah, you don't have to travel every weekend. I didn't have to travel every weekend. I didn't have to go to the races. If they wanted me to go to the races, it was extra fee to go to you know Texas or Loretta's or whatever. Um, but it was like be with them, you know, two days a week during the track at, at the track during the week. Um, you know, set up their off bike stuff you know i did mo i still did most of the road rides most you know i just set it up to where i could have more of that family time but still be doing this so i had more amateurs you know to make up for you know the the financial side and uh that's when it started becoming tough was then you're dealing with more dads um with amateurs that you know, every dad thinks their kid's going to make it, mm. which not every kid's going to make it. So for me, like I would, I'm going to get every, give every kid the best I have to give them the best opportunity to do their best. And, uh, some of them took it and some of them didn't. And, and another hard part would come in when, when I would be doing what I need to do with my riders. And then the dad would be telling me, how to do it you know i'm not going to their job telling them how to do their job that they're making their money to pay for their kid to go racing but then with my background you would think well this guy's got it figured out like let's just let him do what he needs to do yeah he's the expert and uh you know <laughs> get there and make it happen because it took even with ryan it was probably at least two and a half years, almost going into the third year before Danny just kind of took the reins off me and kind of let me do what I needed to do. All the way up until then, it was like I had to answer to Danny for pretty much every day of training. Who's Danny? The, uh, Ryan's dad, Villapoto's yeah, okay. dad. Oh, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and it was just um, he needed to know why we were doing everything. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And then I, would, I had no problem explaining it to him. Yeah. But it took a long time before he just was hands off. Yeah. And yeah. let me and Ryan just do what we needed to do. So it was a, uh, but yeah, the dads are tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think trainers, it's always such a hard gig, you know, like the trainer is always the first person that people blame the train is always that you're you're such a replaceable person in the industry like yeah. if you get fired there's 10 other dudes that'll 
tell you, oh, what did Randy have you doing? Oh, that's fucking wrong. You got to do it. Well, know. they didn't wait for you to get fired. Well, that's I've true. actually been in the car with my riders when another trainer calls them on speakerphone telling them how much better they could make them than I was. That's insane. I've been in the car with other trainers doing that behind your back. And why is it such a ruthless game, you think? I don't know. I never did that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like I said, I, I gave everything that I had to the riders that I had. And if they took it, great. If they didn't, like that's fine too you yeah. know like everybody's gonna make their own choices but i have been around this game a long time and i have a pretty good idea like even mumford like when he was getting to the upper level on the 250 before the whole geico thing went away like kind of towards the end of us working together he's like dude all we're doing is motos you don't need to do that that's old school that's old school training and when he went to bud's creek his first year he was done yeah he's like that's gnarly and then a couple months later he comes to me and he's like dude i talked to cooper and he did like 60 something motos before the season even started yeah and i'm like oh i thought that was old school yeah <laughs> like yeah you got to do the work man like there's no shortcut no no dude no i mean i'm like training for world vets yeah at, at the moment you know and it's like i think i've done I'm at probably like 54 motos for the year with like 20s that I'm, yeah. I think my races are like 12 minutes, but man, I've just been fucking burying myself. Like I, I, when I was in Dubai for those few months at the start of the year, I bought a 450 and it's like a huge sand dune track. It's like seven kilometers for one lap. So three laps is a 20 minute moto Jeez. for me. Yeah. And hot as balls like struggling can barely ride like i just there's so many motos this year where i've just wanted to quit and just like not maybe not riding but just that moto and just yeah. be like fuck it i'm done i'm too hot i'm dehydrated i didn't sleep good like just every negative thought going through your mind it's like it's been regardless of what happens at world that's like it's been quite an interesting experience yeah. this year doing that many motos like Glen Helen the other day it was like 100 and something dude it's like it was hot. crazy yeah. hot I was on a 450 borrowed 450 Yamaha never in the Yamaha before shout out Brad West uh <laughs> never rode a Yamaha 450 before didn't want to do a 20 minute moto on that bike in 110 degree heat but just you got to just went out and and did it you know you gotta so do the work. Like, but imagine so that's me trying to get ready for a silly little 12 minute race in Glen Helen in November. So it's like, imagine the amount of work that goes into doing like a, yeah, Bud's Creek or like your yeah. pro day. There's no substitute for just doing And then you got a 16 year old telling you that's no wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's old school. <laughs> I'm like, what? We're excited to announce the launch of our new membership site, gypsytales.com, packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else. This is your chance to become a part of the Gypsy Gang. And as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125. Gypsy Gang.